Would you echo in your heart the prayer that we offer together? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Speak just now some message to meet my need, which thou only dost know. Speak now through thy holy word and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, would you open your Bible, please, at the first book of Samuel and the 27th chapter. First Samuel and chapter 27. We'll take a moment to read this chapter together. First Samuel, chapter 27. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape, that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the six hundred men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ainoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, De Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites, for those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land as thou goest assure, even unto the land of Egypt. And David smote the land, and left neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep, and the oxen, and the asses, and the camels, and the apparel, and returned, and came to Achish. And Achish said, Whither have you made a road today? And David said, Against the south of Judah, and against the south of the Jeremiahites, and against the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gath, saying, Lest they should tell on us saying, So did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore he shall be my servant forever. Yesterday morning, we were considering in the life of David an incident in which he was exposed to the temptation of taking the initiative, making a grab for the throne, and getting rid of his enemies. And we saw David wonderfully triumphing in that temptation. But now we see something's gone wrong somewhere. That's quite evident from the tone of this passage. And here we see a man of God giving in to a fit of depression. This is one very wonderful thing about the word. It never flatters its heroes. The Bible tells the truth about everybody. No other book does. But the word of God is never afraid to expose the failures of those whom God ultimately is going to lead through in victory. You see, the Holy Spirit delights to work against the background of human impossibility. I don't know that I could take chapter and verse for this statement, but I believe it to be true that when God wants an impossible sort of job done, he gets hold of an impossible sort of person, smashes him up, and then uses him. And we are considering in these mornings together something of the breaking process in the life of David. And therefore we find ourselves traveling along this road which tells us of his victories and also reveals to us 
his faith. And here we see him yielding to this fit of depression and saying in his heart, verse 1, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. At one moment, here's this man after God's own heart facing circumstances which were calculated to test him, to give him the opportunity of taking the initiative, give him the chance of retaliation, and we see him wonderfully overcoming. And at the next moment, he's still confronted with this constant, ceaseless, relentless pressure from his lifelong enemy, Saul. And so relentless is the pressure that he's tempted to give up, to get discouraged, and uh, just to hand over the fight. And this is the kind of anvil, if I may use the word, upon which the character of a man of God is hammered out. This is the kind of thing that puts iron into the soul. This is the kind of situation, this is the kind of fiery furnace through which any man of God must pass to be melted and forged into the character that God purposes for him. It's interesting to notice a moment the language of David at this particular time in his life. It's all in the minor key. I remind you of some of it. Psalm 10, verse 1 just quoting some of the things that David was saying in his heart at this particular moment. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in time of trouble? Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord? Wilt thou forget me forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Quite obviously, here's a man at breaking point. And I wonder if that isn't a familiar experience to many of you here this morning. I wonder if the frequency of this recurring attack of depression is one of your chief problems. I wonder if you come every day to the task and to your work and to your testimony with a feeling of despair, almost at the point of throwing up the sponge and even hurling everything and even yourself out of the window. It's just no use going on. Are you the victim of moods like that? Now, don't be discouraged. Paul was pressed in spirit. This is the kind of a thing that attacks all of us. But the question is, our reactions and what we do when we're faced with it. Well, now, come with me this morning, folks, into the quietness of the presence of the Lord, into the treasury of his word, and let's look at the reason for depression, at the result of giving way to it, and then at the remedy for it. Taking this incident in David's life a moment, what was the reason for his depression? It would seem that he had ample excuse. It seemed to be absolutely hopeless to change the attitude of Saul. In spite of his kindness to him, in spite of the proving to him that he wasn't really seeking to destroy him. In spite of having shown to him perfectly clearly, as we saw yesterday morning, that he wasn't his enemy, none of these things had affected Saul. This man was just eaten up with jealousy, and he was determined not to end the fight until it finished with murder. He was bent upon murder. There's a very little statement, a revealing statement, don't bother to look it up, just note it down if you like, 1 Samuel 23, 14, in which we read, Every day did Saul seek him. In other words, it was absolutely relentless, and the pressure was never taken off, 
No matter how David reacted to the enemy, he kept on attacking him. And beside all this, don't forget, David had 600 men, plus women and children, of whom there were many, under his care. And two wives of his own, and a family. And how to provide sustenance for all that crowd, and how to avoid capture by 3,000 men who were after him all the time and who knew every inch of the territory. Ooh, this man had plenty of reason, or at least plenty of excuse, to say, Now I shall perish one day at the hand of Thor. Now I don't know about you, but I don't find it hard to find myself exactly in that position. Just right there. If you are a committed Christian, I underline the word committed, if you are a committed Christian, that is, that every part of your life, to the best of your knowledge, is committed to Jesus Christ without reserve, then you have become, since the moment of your commitment, the subject of the constant buffeting of the devil. You remember the language of Ephesians 6, don't you? Verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, the committed Christian is against And in such a warfare, there's no intermission. Satan never takes a day off. Never. He's working seven days a week, night and day. Never relax. And the remarkable thing about the devil, at least as far as I can find it, there's never any disunity in his rank. While the church indulges in the luxury of civil war, and thereby ruins itself, satanic power is totally united and totally committed and absolutely dedicated to the complete spiritual murder of anybody who claims that he's indwelt by divine nature from heaven. And uh, he has an endless variety of methods of attack. And uh, he's got one colossal advantage. One tremendous advantage, and that is that in every one of our lives, there's a traitor, only too ready and eager to betray us into the hand of the devil. And oh, brother and sister, I don't know about you, but thousands of times I've only been saved from him by a miracle. And enemies which I thought were slain long ago, and I'd left behind in childhood days, have risen up again to attack me with renewed strength, especially when I'm depressed. And if he's been baffled in one attack, then he's withdrawn himself, the fiend that he is, how I hate him, and he's gathered together seven spirits more foul than any other, and he's renewed the battle, and he's dared to intrude so often upon one's personal devotional life and sought to kill you right there. Because, you see, he is determined on spiritual murder. Certainly, I am dead to sin in Christ, but sin is never dead to me. Now, if that language is strange to you, and if you say concerning the preacher, he's a queer sort of guy, don't congratulate yourself, will you? For if the devil isn't doing that with you, it's either, it's either because as an unbeliever he doesn't have to bother about you because you're his already. Or worse still, worse still, as a professing Christian, you've given up the fight. And your religion is no more than a frequently repeated and often used rehearsal of evangelical pious vocabulary, which is totally unrelated to your daily experience. But in the secret of your soul, you found the pressure was so hot that you've given in. So don't congratulate yourself. 
if the language that I have just used seems strange. But if what I say is indeed true of your personal experience, then no wonder what David said has sometimes been said by you. I shall one day perish at the hand of the devil. The reason for depression. You're having a hot time with the devil today? If you're on your trail and he's got you buffeted and battered, as, as, as Philip says in his translation of uh, Paul's tremendous testimony, often knocked down, but never knocked out. And Satan has been knocking you down, and he's been hitting at you, and you have found since your commitment to Christ, and since the exposure of your life to the ministry at this college, you have found yourself the constant target of everything that hell can fling at you. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad. I think that's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I remember visiting a college in London a little while, some years ago now. It was uh, destroyed during the war, but it was a wonderful missionary training college in southeast London, um, founded by Captain Godfrey Buxton. Some of you may know him. It has produced many men of God, Harold Wildish, Stephen Alford, others were all through that college and pre-war day. And I remember I went one day to see the place and to speak to the students, and it was a rugged place of rugged discipline, really rough. You should have seen the campus. I don't think you'd have been too attracted by that. Talk about cafeteria, oh boy. It wasn't that, believe me, no such luxury at all. Just a little stove on which you did your own cooking. It was really rugged. But you know, I went there one day, and after I'd spoken to them, I, I, I looked at the account statement for the past year on the, on, the, on, the, on the notice board, and it said expenditure for the past few months was so much, and it, receipts were so much, balance in the bank was, let's see, in American currency, about, uh, about $9, I think. And then it said underneath this, if this balance is further reduced by another uh, $4, all orders for food, including eggs and milk, will be stopped immediately. And I thought, ooh, what a college. I think I'll do a place like that. And then underneath, in big letters, written right across the statement, it said, but hallelujah anyway. And you know, those three words have been with me for the rest of my life, and I they always will be till I get to heaven. They've meant more to me than anything else. And when Satan's just crowding on everything he has, well, hallelujah, anyway. But it isn't so easy to take that line. And therefore I want to ask you to notice what was the result of giving in to depression. Because, you see, we're facing here a little glimpse into the biography of the man who gave in. Supposing we give in. Well, what then? It, dare I say this to you? Do you know that at first sight it almost looks like being worthwhile? It almost looks like being worthwhile to give in. Look at verse 4. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. Well, the battle's been called off. The enemy's withdrawn. The pressure's released. Satan has retired. And for the moment, apparently, peace has descended upon your heart. Oh, yeah. To give in will guarantee an immediate removal of the pressure. And to yield to all the attacks of the enemy will assure you at that very moment that the pressure which has been almost intolerable is immediately taken off. It almost seems to pay. Oh, but listen. The peace, how shall I put this? 
the peace which is the outcome of injecting a tranquilizer is one thing and the peace which is the outcome of overcoming in battle is another one. The one is like being rolled into a stupor. The other is a triumphant rest in the heart in the thick of the fight. You give in to the devil, my friend, and I promise you, I promise you, you can, in quote, enjoy the first of these right now. And if that's what you want, it's open to you at any minute. You may move into enemy-occupied territory and immediately have that stupor in your soul and the cessation of battle. And a dead calm will descend upon you at once. And Satan will get off your neck and there'll be three cheers in hell. Oh, friend, you say temptation is grim. Sure is. I'll tell you something grimmer, not to be tempted at all. Oh, the battle is terrific. Yes, but if there's no battle, it's a thousand times worse. Oh, but the pressure of the enemy is intolerable. Yes, indeed. But when the enemy takes his hand off, and he sees you've given in, and he relaxes, and he says to his agent, now we don't need to bother about him, just let him be for a while. And there descends into the heart of the man who's given in a spiritual stupor in which he has no attack from the devil, but he also has no hunger for the word of God, and no concern to pray, and no interest in the things of the Lord, and no, no burden for souls, and no concern, no concern about the mission field. And all these things just die out on him because the pressure's taken Oh, yes, you can get the pressure off. And into your soul at that moment, there's the deadness of a stupor that has to be experienced to be believed. And as I think I said to you earlier this week, if that's happened to you, I beg of you in Jesus' name to dare to go into the presence of God in all your deadness of stupor and say, Lord Jesus, please let the devil loose on my life again quick. Oh, yeah. The result of depression is just that. But look, what about the consequences? How dishonoring, how dishonoring it was for David to give in, how dishonoring to the Lord. There's a lovely little verse I just picked up in reading and preparing this morning. I haven't time to go into the context, but if you look back at, at um, 1 Samuel 25 and verse 29, Here's Abigail speaking to David and giving him a little promise from the Lord in which she says this, Yet a man is risen up to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But look at this lovely thing. Isn't this a lovely word? But the soul of my Lord, that David, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, then shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. That must have taken David back to his Goliath days. Oh, how easy. How easy when God fights the battle. Just putting his enemies like a little stone in a sling and stinging them up. That's how God deals with the devil. Now, this was a reminder of what God can do for this man. Is all that to be proved untrue? Hasn't it all been confirmed by Jonathan and by Saul himself? Hadn't David at one time said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Though a host shall encamp against me, I shall not be afraid. In the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Are all God's promises to be just empty and all my previous experiences of his power and grace to be proved to be absolutely vain and to be overthrown and denied? How dishonoring to the Lord to yield to depression. Oh, but I can imagine the language of David in his present mood saying, but you know, folks, the trouble is the Lord has, got, has undertaken more than he can tackle. The thing's getting out of hand, and he just has, he doesn't know what to do with the situation. I, I know he's kept me so far, but the situation is really getting too tough even for heaven to cope with. And sooner or later, Saul's going to get the better of me, and it's so foolish to attempt the impossible. I've waited long enough for the Lord to do something about it, till I'm sick of waiting. 
Surely it's time now for me to act and get myself out of the net. Oh, Dad. Hope it all you and all me. It's one thing to condemn somebody else when they give in to depression. But what about yourself and what about myself? What about my own behavior when the waters have overwhelmed me at times in my life? How dishonoring to the law. But look, how harmful to his friends. Do you notice something here in this chapter? When, when uh, David went to Philistine territory, when he ran away, he got into enemy-occupied territory, Achish welcomed him very gladly. The devil always does, of course. Very happy to see a man on the retreat, man of God on the run. Achish gave him Ziklag for a city to inhabit. Ziklag. What sort of place is that? Well, it's a city down in the southern part of Judah. It belonged, I find, as I trace its story in the Old Testament, it belonged by right to Judah. It had been captured by the Philistines, but they had never occupied it. As a matter of fact, First Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 30 tells us that it had been left, it had been left in possession of the descendants of Simeon. And apparently these people had no stomach for a battle with the enemy. They were perfectly happy to settle down with a sort of peaceful coexistence with the Philistines. Peace at any price was the motto of the people who lived in Ziklag. <laughs> and that's the place, that's the place that Achish let David live in. Oh, what a disastrous effect would that must have had upon the fighting qualities of his crew. What poison must have been injected into their system and into their heart? I believe, I believe that you can trace the origin of all idol worship on the part of the Israelitish nation from this experience where these 600 men got living among people who just were satisfied to settle down to a peaceful existence with the heathen. And this was the root of something that got into the very system of God's people. And I am perfectly sure that some of those 600 gruff, gruff, brave, and yet undisciplined, tough men that followed David anywhere, I am sure that they were thankful for a little respite and a little relief from danger and glad to accept a large spiritual standard to take the heat off and the pressure off, make things a bit easier for them. Oh, my friend, I would say this to you very carefully and earnestly in the presence of God because I'm just talking out of my heart to you this morning. I know these things in my own life. If I give in to the enemy, oh, how widespread are the consequences. How widespread are the consequences. How thankful Christian people are May I say this? How thankful many people in Moody Church would be if I lowered the standard. How glad. How glad they'd be if their pastor, I don't say this unkindly, but if he gave in. People are always glad when the leader falls because it gives them an excuse for a policy of peace at any price. Let's live, you know, in God's territory. Let's believe God's word. Let's, let's be sound and fundamental. Let's believe all that we should believe. Let's, don't, let's get unorthodox. Oh, my, no. Let's be premillennial and pre-everything else and all the rest. Let's have the whole thing lined up and let's be correct in our theology. Let's be right, you see. Let's be right. Let's be known for our fundamental Bible-believing, blood-washed uh, fellowship, but don't let trouble the enemy too much. Get him off our backs. Let's take things a bit more easy. And the awful dread in my soul. I tell you, folks, it's real to me today as I speak to you about it. The dread in my heart is that somehow I might allow Satan to make me descend to that level where in some issue I am saying, all right, let's settle down to a peaceful coexistence. God forbid. 
It's total warfare against every attack of the devil all the time till we see Jesus face to face. And anything less than that is abandonment of the will of God, surrender to compromise, defeat, tragic defeat, the cutting off of the power of the Holy Ghost and spiritual bankruptcy. Oh, how harmful to other people where a Christian gives in. And then, how harmful, not only how dishonoring to the Lord and harmful to his friends, but, but oh, how hurtful to David's own life. Look what happened to him here. Look at, look at this man of God. See what happens the moment he gives in. Just follow it a minute. You see, they're welcomed in verse 3. They're welcomed with open arms by Achish. Of course. Of course. Just think of the difference that David and 600 men could mean to the Philistines in battle. Why, these 600 men knew the territory and they, uh, th 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 these men were trained to fight, trained in battle, they were tough and rugged. Why, why the devil, the enemy, the Philistines were adding to their, to their, to their ranks the cream of the opposition. Of course they were welcome. And, and if in some issue in your heart, beloved, friend, you desert to the enemy, you can turn the battle in favor of hell. That's a dreadful thing, but you can. You can. You can, you can turn the whole spiritual battle of your immediate environment and friends and circumstance and testimony. You can turn it in favor of the enemy. But look at the awful deceit and lie that David had to stoop to. Somehow, you see, he'd got to live, had to live. And his only way of living was by plunder. And so in verse 8, you notice that he attacks the occupants of the south part of the land, the Geshurites and the Amalekites. Nomad tribes who were the enemies of Judah. Ah, oh, notice this, notice this, won't you? Though he got himself in enemy-occupied territory, his heart was still with the people of God. That's a battle that goes on in the soul of a man who's deserted from the Lord. He's still attacking the enemy of Judah. He's got to live. He can't bring himself to attack God's people, though he's on the enemy's side publicly. He's deserted, and yet in his heart, in his heart, he longs to be right. And in order to fool Achish, and make him think he's attacking the Israelites. He's obliged, in verse 9, he's obliged to slaughter both women and children and leave no trace of the battle. And then he's asked for a report of his activities by his new master, Achan. Where have you been today, David? What have you been doing? Verse 10. And David said, that, well... I have been attacking against the south of the Jeremelites, the south of Judah, against the south of the Kenites. David, you liar. You haven't. You haven't. Do you want Achish to believe? But you didn't. You've been attacking the Philistines. And so Achish is really made to believe, verse 12, that he has, David, has made his people Israel <coughs> utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. You still in this picture? I have been. All the agony of it. No wonder the music of this man's life has changed to a minor key. It's rather like going in one switch from handles Messiah to the jukebox in a drugstore. Just about that. What a poor exchange. And what a blight descends on the soul. And what a silencing of the strong in the heart when a man has given in to depression and expedience. I always think it's, it must be a decisive moment in any flight, when the control tower signals to the pilot, you're on your own. And I think it's a tragedy 
when because of a Christian yielding to the pressure of the enemy and giving in to depression, he's driven into a tight corner from which he only can escape by deceit and lies and by a course of conduct that makes him despise himself. And then suddenly you begin to realize, friend, you begin to realize that you've purchased deliverance from the devil at too great a price. And you've exchanged the smile of God for the smile of Achish. And uh, you've, you, you've, you've exchanged the protection of the covenant of the blood of Jesus for the walls of Ziklag. And very soon those walls are going to lie in ruins around you and you're going to stand over them and sob your heart out. That's what happened to David. Ah, the result of giving in to the end. But quickly, I want to close on the positive note. The thing needn't happen. Bless the Lord, it needn't happen. And by the grace of God, it won't happen. And it can't happen. It mustn't happen to any of us. For there's a remedy for depression. What is it? Go back a moment to the text. First verse. And David said in his heart, Stop. That's where he's gone wrong. That's exactly it. He's been talking with himself instead of with God. David said in his heart, Go back a moment to one or two other jams in which David was. First Samuel 23, verse 2. First Samuel 23, verse 2. Then, therefore, David inquired of the Lord. Verse 4. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Chapter 30, verse 8. Chapter 30, verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord. But right in between, David said in his heart, Oh, I think that's it. I think so. At other times, he's inquiring of the Lord. But at this point, he's still and he's been overcome by panic and without referring to the Lord and without referring to the word he said in his heart remedy for depression never act in a panic be still May I use this term which might surprise you, but it's a term which is absolutely real. In the moment of depression, force yourself into the presence of the Lord Jesus. And I say, force yourself. Because I say that all the barrier of hell will be standing there to keep you away. Force yourself into the presence of Christ. And wait until your pulse returns to normal. When you are most anxious to do something, and when you say to yourself, the time has come when I simply must act, that's the time when you'll make the biggest blunder. Don't say in your heart what you will do or what you won't do. Wait upon God. In New Testament language, abide in Christ and keep on abiding reckon yourself dead to sin in Christ and go on reckoning set your affections upon things that are above and go on setting them there wait until God makes his way plain you see so long as God's way is hidden from you if you think about it there's obviously no need to do anything because he's responsible for all the results of keeping you right where you are. With all the attacks and all the pressure and all the fury of the enemy concentrated upon you, the Lord's responsible for keeping you there. And let the enemy rage on every side while you wait upon him. 
Oh, what a precious thing it is that we can, we can, we can learn to do that. Where would we be if we hadn't the refuge of the wounded side of Jesus? We'd be destitute. And then just remember, just remember, I think I've just a minute to, uh, you must read it for yourself, but David wrote Psalm 56 around this time. Psalm 56. And this is what he's saying. This is, this is what he's saying to the Lord. This is what the Lord is saying to him. I'll give you one or two of these verses. Verse 10 and 11, Psalm 56. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. As I wait upon God with the enemy furiously raging on all sides, remember, God's promises are sure. He's provided for our acceptance with him through the blood of his own son. He's provided for a way for making us, remaking us into his likeness by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. And one of the greatest factors for the remaking of a man of God into the likeness of the Lord Jesus is the furious attack of the enemy and the temptation to depression which is resisted by the dynamic power of the Holy Ghost. None shall ever pluck us out of his hand. But God's promises are conditional, verse 9, when I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. When I cry unto thee, there isn't a promise in the book that's mine until by faith I claim it, until I repent and believe the gospel and turn to the Lord in total surrender. Say, folks, just a second, let me ask you. Are you afraid today, depressed, cast down? Panic-stricken spiritually. What's the reason for your fear? Examine. Are you afraid lest God should forget his word and allow you to perish, notwithstanding that you trust him? Ah, uh, that criminal fear. Or are you afraid because you haven't really come to Christ and you haven't really committed your life to him and you haven't come in God's appointed way through the blood? then maybe all the pressures upon you right now are just being brought upon you just to break your heart and to bring you to Jesus. Examine the cause of your fear. Have you fled to Jesus for refuge? If not, any hope of acceptance with God is just sheer presumption. But maybe you're afraid, desperately afraid, panic-stricken spiritually in the life of this college under the exposure of its ministry because thy heart is not right with God. And let me say in conclusion that God's promises are corrective. Verse 13, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? David had said in the portion that we've just read, first Samuel 27, There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the hand of the Philistines. That was his first reaction. In other words, the pressure of the devil drove him from the Lord. Ah, but in the midst of the pressure to learn to wait upon God, to know that all things work together for good to them that love him. All things. Not easy to say. All things. To them that love him. But nothing in the universe can ever separate the man of God from the love of Christ. And so now David is saying, Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the land of the living? In other words, now instead of the pressures drawing him away, the pressures are driving him right back. If you forget anything else I've said, just remember this. Never allow the pressure of the enemy to drive you away from the wounded side of Jesus the only place to your safe. For in the midst of similar pressure, the Apostle Paul, writing from a Roman jail, said in Philippians 1, verse 20, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. How do you magnify something? Two ways. One, microscope. Two, telescope. A microscope makes a little thing big. The telescope makes a distant thing come near. Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Whatever the outcome of this, he will be magnified. And brother, Jesus was never little to be made big. But oh God forgive us, sometimes he's been very distant to be made near. You know these lovely words? In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear. And saints is such confiding, for nothing changes here. The storm that may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me. Can I be dismayed? Hallelujah. Anyway, let's pray. <laughs> Jesus, keep me near the cross, there, my glory ever. Lord, write thy word upon my heart today, upon all of our hearts. And may Satan once again have suffered a resounding defeat and be driven back by the power of thy spirit and the power of protection of thy precious blood in each one of the lives of these thy children. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us all. Till the morning shall dawn, the day shall break, the shadows flee away, and we see him face to face.